Hey, what's up everybody? Today we're gonna talk about why you should focus on your health span versus your lifespan and its importance as it relates to your immunity and longevity. You're watching Modern Aging where we chat about innovative and holistic ways to elevate our health and well-being as we age. I want you to be sure to click on that little button down below that says subscribe on it and that little bell next to it so you'll be sure to be notified whenever a new episode is uploaded. Today's guest is Rachel Van Pelt. She's a health span scientist and coach. She helps women take back their body, energy and strength in midlife and beyond and I'm so happy to have you on the show today. Rachel, welcome. Thank you, Risa. I'm glad to be here. You are in Denver, I believe, right? Correct. So tell me, how did you actually get into this whole field? You were in geriatrics, is that correct? Correct. Yeah, I my uh, background and my trainings as an integrative physiologist. And uh, I've done 25 years of clinical research on healthy aging and women's health, a lot around obesity and diabetes and health span. And most of those years at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and as, as you mentioned, in a division of geriatric medicine. Um, the reason that I went into this field is uh, back in my 20s, I learned that I had the bone density of an 80 year old. Whoa. I was an extremely fit collegiate athlete. And but despite that, I I was not taking care of other aspects of my health. I was fit, but I wasn't necessarily healthy because my nutrition was out of whack, my stress hormones. Uh, I was chronically sleep deprived. I was a rower. We had early morning practice, that kind of thing. And, uh, and it really inspired me to start thinking about how you could already have accelerated aging even at such a young age in your 20s and inspired me to go on to to study this and see how we could prevent that from happening to other people wow oh my god so how do you even know that you have low bone density yeah i I, it just so happened typically you wouldn't be tested for that in your 20s but it just so happened that one of the godmothers of exercise physiology barbara drinkwater was doing research at the university of washington in seattle at the time and I got recruited to be in a research study and wow. I my bone density tested. It's a DEXA, uh, uh, you know, it's the same thing that we use to, to test bone and mineral density in, in postmenopausal women. But I just so happened to, to enroll in her study and found out that my bone density was already pretty bad. And she was surprised because I was doing a lot of weight bearing activity, you know, lifting weights. I wasn't underweight all that so it was it was sort of remarkable that you could have cellular aging going on even though i was you know chronologically a very young woman wow that's pretty scary um so you mentioned health span um so what is health span yeah health span so you, you know lifespan is the number of years that you live your longevity but health span is how good you live those years what your quality of life is what your how healthy you are whether you're you know avoiding disease and cellular aging that kind of thing so health spans all about quality the quality of those years that you live i feel like there's such a focus on the number right we, we focus on lifespan on how old you are the chronological age as opposed to biological age or um why do you th- why do you think that is and how do we shift that yeah, I, you know, I think longevity and lifespan's gotten a lot of airtime, a lot of press these days because, you know, there's a lot of really fun science that's going on, particularly in animal in rodents, <laughs> that looks at how long we can, you know, how we can increase longevity. And it's exciting, it's cutting edge, but it's easy to forget that you know, what good is increasing how many years we have if we're if we're living most of those years, you know, in in rapid decline, you know, ending up on multiple medications in and out of the hospital, undergoing multiple surgeries, invasive procedures and ending up in a nursing home. And most of us don't envision that for our life. And and, you know, I think we do a disservice if we simply focus on strategies that help people extend their life by a few years rather than really improve the quality of years we have while we're around. So, I mean, how do we do that? How do we, I mean, at what age do you 
feel that people really should be focused on their health span? And what is it that we're not doing that we should be doing, even at the minimum, right? I, I mean, I feel like there are certain things that everybody knows, right? We shouldn't be eating processed foods. You know, we're eating too much sugar. We're not exercising enough. Um, I think it's that and more. But like, at what point should we say, okay, we really need to start thinking about this seriously? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question because, of course, I learned in my 20s that you could be aging prematurely. It can start at any age. You know, our, there's chronological age, or just, you know, the clock is ticking, and then there's biological aging, and that can happen at any age. But I, I focus a lot on midlife because that is when declines start to happen fairly precipitously. You know, for women, of course, we have menopause and we hit menopause and a lot of things. It accelerates changes in a lot of things because our, our hormones are changing pretty dramatically. But men too, men have a lot of hormonal changes midlife. And they're, they're, truly we see a lot of inflection point in, in the data for a lot of different aspects of our physiology changing, whether it be declines in muscle mass, bone mineral density, you know, increases in fat mass, changes in our, our, uh, the quality of those tissues, the, the way our, our organs function. There's so many things that we start getting to this sort of a precipice where things really start to drop off. And so I really like to focus midlife because, um, that's a time when, and we also have a lot of keep competing priorities around that time of life. You know, we've got, we've got career, stresses, we've got family, you know, responsibilities, lots of things going on midlife. And that oftentimes interferes with with lifestyle habits that will help, you know, to, to slow a lot of that aging process. So doubling down at midlife to really have a big impact on the trajectory of our health span, because, um, you know, I always like to say it's never too late to start. Uh, but it's also never too early to start, but you can probably have the biggest impact on the trajectory of your health span, the trajectory of those age-related declines by making big changes midlife. So when you say age-related declines, I actually talked to a geriatrician once, and he told me that if you start doing minimal exercise, even walking every single day at age 40, you'll start, you can actually extend kind of the signs of losing balance by at 80. But if you do not, and you choose to be a couch potato, you'll start losing your balance at 60, which is 20 years. I mean, that's a huge, that's a, 20 years is a long time. Um, what do you recommend people, you know, people who want to get there? Um, are there minimal things that you think people should be doing? Um, what are the ideal things that people should be kind of like the the different factors that they should be looking at when they're thinking about, you know, I want to make sure that I'm healthy when I'm 70, 80, 90 years old? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, there, it's uh, as an integrated physiologist, of course, I think about how all aspects of our physiology are integrated, our cardiovascular system, our musculoskeletal system, our nervous system, our endocrine system, everything is highly integrated. And so is our approach to uh, lifestyle habits. So uh, physical activity, nutrition, sleep, self-care, stress management, that kind of thing. All of that goes hand in hand with, it's all in it, all of that is integrated and is really important for, for changing all those aspects of our physiology. If, and, then the, and you asked about the minimal amount, you know, we, it, when, we, when we leverage, when we make those changes midlife, and I love that example that you used that the geriatrician used of like how you leveraging, making small changes midlife can have drastic changes long term. And I know we don't always think that far off, but you can make, you know, small, very impactful changes in your physical activity and in, in how you eat and how you sleep, getting good quality of sleep and, and, and mental uh, well-being can go a long way towards radically changing how how your how your physiology declines over over a 20 to 30 year period so do you feel like there is um 
like should we be doing a minimum of 30 minutes of exercise does it matter does it matter how what are you know I'm assuming it does but you know there could be 10 different 40 year olds but you know we all are of have different um like you had you know the bone density of an 80 year old at 20 something I mean at 40 or 50 you know I imagine those differences are pretty drastic you know whether it's you know weight or um you know other chronic illnesses that might be within you know in our bodies or you know um but there are at minimum you're talking about exercise you're talking about sleep you're talking about nutrition um I'm just trying to think is there kind of I feel like it's definitely very custom depending on the person but is there something that like a 10 point list that people should really be thinking about and how do we make that something that's attractive and doable because like you said we're all so busy right we're all we have all these different stresses and a lot of time the self-care goes to the bottom of the list um yeah so are there certain things that you recommend that we do that we can kind of increase that yeah you know it's it's a great question you know it's it's a it's a complicated question in the sense that yes it you know it you know, we talk a lot about personalized medicine in 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 the medical field. That you know, and trying to really drill down and get real specific about you know you know testing people for different genes and risk factors and getting and really drilling down. But to be honest, the the there are simple, very simple, minimal changes that you can make to your physical activity, you know, strength, you know, one of the, one of the, the big things that I see is there's way too much focus on say exercise and diet for weight loss. And there's way too much focus on, you know, uh, on trying to lose weight, which is actually, you know, one of the is low on the priority list when we get say past 50, because weight loss actually sets us up for bone loss, muscle loss, uh, and sets us up for weight regain. And so we, we were kind of chasing the wrong course at that point. So we do have to change our focus. That's one thing about aging and midlife and, and tackling midlife declines is making sure we're focused on the things that are going to keep us healthy mastering our healthy longevity our health span things that are going to preserve our bone mineral density preserve our balance so we're not falling you know preserve muscle mass so we're staying mobile um, and can keep doing our, our our activities of daily living as we get older and you know one of the challenges that i see is that we so not only are we focused too much on weight loss we, we don't focus enough on making changes that are going to keep us you know, off medications, you know, out of the hospital, not, you know, preventing falls and fractures and the things that really do debilitate us as we get older. And so, you know, a 10 point list, I I don't have that exactly, but I do, there are, you know, critical things that, you know, like weight falls way down on the list of things that we need to worry about as we get past and into our 50s and 60s and 70s. And we need to focus way more on maintaining our muscle and our bone and balance and, uh, you know, spine health, that kind of thing. Our mental, of course, slowing mental decline. So then, you know, stress management, managing anxiety and depression to get become more of a priority than they were maybe even in our 30s, you know, and 40s. So, so, so there is a shift in the focus and there, but there are, you know, very simple, you know, we don't have to get incredibly, um, you know, personalized and specific I don't think we need to get a specific, you know, I think there's some low lying fruit. I think that there are simple changes that we can make to our physical activity and, you know, and clean eating and, and improving our sleep quality that can have massive impact without taking a lot of time and, um, and personalize, you know, effort. And it's also cumulative, right? So if we even do like 10 minutes every day, whether it's a little jog or a walk or some yoga or some stretching or whatever, that will help cumulatively. It's not like, you know, even 10 minutes or 15 minutes, whatever, whatever you can do actually will help. Um, 
And so when you so when you talk about clean eating, are you talking about organics and or eating organic food, getting off of meat, dairy, that sort of thing? Do you I don't is is it elimination diets type of yeah. thing? No processed <laughs> foods. I mean, I know there's like, and then I don't know how you feel about like the ketos and the paleos and the intermittent fastings and the you know the list of diets uh, kind of goes on and on and on. Um, I don't. How do you feel about that in terms of as it relates to once you're 50 and going on these diets. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, like I said, I think, you know, taking the focus off of weight loss. I mean, yes, we want to prevent weight gain. We want to maintain our muscle, all that. Uh, but taking the focus off weight loss and eating, eating in such a way that we're, we're maximizing the amount of nutrients we ha we're getting into our body. So when I say clean, I know everybody has a different definition for what clean eating is. And it's, it's kind of um, funny, really, if you if you polled a lot of people, you'd get different answers. In my in it, we really need to increase the number of fruits and vegetables that we're getting into our diet every day, really ratchet that up, you know, five a day is not enough. We really, for our bodies to get up, because when we, when we're eating plant-based nutrients, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, berries, all of these real plant-based nutrients, we're getting what are called phytonutrients or plant-based nutrients. And those there's tens of thousands of nutrients in those kinds of foods. You're not going to find that in highly processed, you know, but the foods that you find in boxes in, you know, cans and, and things in the freezer aisle of your supermarket. It, it really is about ratcheting up the amount of nutrients we get into our body, nourishing our gut microbiome, which is really important, especially as we get older for brain health and 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 giving our body the tool the tools it needs to repair itself to improve its immune function its hormone balance its metabolism and our and our bodies are really smart <laughs> they they know how to you know how to use those thousands upon thousands of nutrients that's found in those plant based plant based foods and you can't replicate that with a vitamin. You can't just pop a pill and think, you know, you're getting enough, new, even a multivitamin, you know, that's still just a handful of um, vitamins that have been isolated from fruits and vegetables and things. And most of those aren't even used. Whereas our body, if we eat whole, these whole foods, plant-based foods, it, you know, knows how to use wit, you know, may not need the, the, 20,000 nutrients you just ate, but it'll use the two to 3,000 nutrients that it needs in very smart and synergistic ways. So it gets what it needs for, uh, for cellular repair, for, for ratcheting up our immune, our immune cell function, uh, you know, for, for regulating our hormones, for helping with our, you know, clearance of the plaques from the brain while we're sleeping. So it's, it's really beautiful. You know, the, the body's pretty miraculous. And when given the right nutrients, it, it, it can keep functioning for a very long time. It, well, when we treat it right, right, <laughs> it can function for a very long time. I think those, many of us are pretty abusive to our bodies and we don't even realize it. Um, and you brought up the immune system. And I think that's something that's on a lot of people's minds with the pandemic and, you know, a potential second wave. And how do we boost our immune systems? How do we make ourselves as strong as possible? And I feel like this is very much in line with kind of focusing on your health span. Um, are there specific things that you think that we should be thinking about um, or eating or doing to ensure that our immune systems are as strong as they can be in midlife? Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, boosting your immune system and bo boosting your health span are almost one in the same. When you are taking the steps to, to be physically active every day, to eat lots, you know, a, a very high nutrient dense, plant-based, mostly plant-based um, diet. When you're getting not just enough sleep, but high quality sleep, when you're, when you're managing your mental well-being, your stress, all of that sets your immune system up to be very robust and, and as I was just talking about with the nutrition, our bodies are pretty miraculous and they know how it knows how to, um, to, to fight off disease, how to fight off viruses and bacterial infections and all of that. And so 
when you get on top of those those four pillars of health, you're you're not only improving your immune system for you know to ward off whatever acute virus you're dealing with today, but also setting yourself up for optimizing your health span long term. I think it's all it just sounds so amazing and everyone you know people who are listening yeah let's let's do this we can do this but of course the reality it's just not as easy right we we see commercials that are luring us into you know having some snack and before you know it you're ordering a pizza and you're eating chips and you're drinking soda and um is there is are, are there certain ways that we can start to eliminate like I feel like having people detox and not being able to eat any of those foods is somewhat of a losing battle um, that they may go and, you know, eat more of it. Or um, do you ever think about or ever talk about cravings and how how do we wean off of bad cravings and, ha you know, mm -hmm. start to create good cravings? Yeah, you know, and and that's a it's really interesting when people are, are are do have their their physical activity dialed in and you know are eating a, a very nutrient dense diet and getting enough sleep and managing stress and have those things dialed in those cravings go away because you know you're 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 waking up energized and feeling good and and you don't have that mid afternoon lag where you you where it's really hard or willpower is really hard to to resist and i i'm certainly not one to vilify those you know it's foods and things like that or make talk about good foods bad foods there's certainly foods that are way better for you and there's nothing wrong with the occasional it's when you it's when you're chronically fatigued and anxious and depressed and not sleeping and and it, it all kind of snowballs because we and you don't have the energy and then you get that mid-afternoon lull and you have to reach for the caffeine or the sugar or something to get give you that boost you need and it's it, it can be really challenging and and you're right it's it's uh, it seems overwhelming there's lots of there's lots working against us <laughs> in terms of marketing for junk foods and things like that we see them all the time and it's hard not to go to the store and be you know and 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 want to buy those things but the but but when we really can get on top of just the, the more and the other thing is is when we when we are nourishing our gut microbiome with lots of fruits and vegetables and whole grains stuff you know, we feel nourished and our, and our, and our, and our gut tells our brain what it's craving. And so if we're nourishing our body with those foods, our body will crave those foods more versus if we're constantly feeding at McDonald's or some other fast food or, you know, or junk food, you know, or whatever, you know, our salty snack of choice or, or sugary snack of choice, the, the our, our, our gut will keep telling us it wants more of that because those are the bacteria that we're, that we're feeding and we're, and we're allowing to flourish in our gut. So, so we can, we can actually eliminate a lot of those cravings, not just with getting better sleep and managing our energy better, but also simply by feeding our body what it needs and our body will start to to, to send signals to our brain that that's what it craves, that it craves, uh, you know, a, a nutrient dense smoothie, for example, in the afternoon rather than uh, a Snickers bar or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's so true, though. Uh, I kind of have been, we I've weaned myself off a few years ago, but I do, you do start to crave, you crave the smoothie. And everyone, you know, my friends look at me like I have five heads, but it's like, no, I don't want the ice cream. I really want the smoothie. They're like, really? <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. I feel so. How do we? Um, we have a lot of go going against us, and it's also the medical system, right? Um, we're taught that a pill is going to cure everything, and so it's easy. So it's easy to believe, and it's, so it's really nice, right? So we can just take a pill to like make whatever pain go away or whatever ailment that's. What do you, what's your response to that? And how do we kind of change that mentality to, uh, to address what's really going on? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. You know, our, our, what's happened over the years is that, you know, we've gotten very reactive rather than proactive that we've, you know, we focus on diagnosing disease and treating 
treating, you know, managing existing disease, waiting till you get disease and managing it with medications or procedures, whatever treatments. And, you know, we, it's, it's easy to forget that, you know, uh, um, uh, an out, you know, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, that there's a whole lot. And, and unfortunately, our medical system is not set up like that. That's not how the doctors are reimbursed. That's not how they're, tra- they're not trained in prevention necessarily. And they don't learn about exercise and nutrition and sleep and stress management, o- only very small amount. And then they're not re- reimbursed for that. So it's not, um, it's just really not in their wheelhouse. The insurance companies are paying for them to diagnose and treat, you know, um, prescribe a medicine, whatever. And that's also kind of, but it's also upon us, I think, as consumers to also to uh, take ownership, to, t- to empower ourselves with our own health and, under- and, and realize that, you know, by the time you're going to the doctor for those symptoms and 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 things that it's you're already getting to that point of where it's 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 a little bit late to be taking action. Not not always. A lot of times we catch things early, even in the medical system. Catch thing people have pre diabetes, and you can do a, you can do a lot to reverse age related declines very quickly with lifestyle. But but just knowing that that's that's not how you know how we're how our doctors are reimbursed and they in in some places are starting to incorporate lifestyle medicine life lifestyle behavioral changes and things like that um but until uh, you know until insurance companies are helping to pay for some of those programs and then it's really incumbent upon us to 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 take action for our own health and 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 find find other folks that can help us to to radically change the trajectory of our health span and keep us out of the hospital and needing all those medications. That's awesome. And so you actually do that. You are a health coach and you help people um, one on one to kind of get on a certain track if they want to to increase specifically their health span. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I have a health span coach. So yeah, really helping folks midlife to, you know, radically reboot all those aspects of their physiology and very simply, you know, in uh, through changes in physical activity and nutrition and sleep and, and self care, all the things that we've been talking about. And, you know, it's and it but it's a it, it you know, it's not like going to a coach isn't because you're broken or, or need fixing or anything. It's really it's it's somebody just to kind of give you the support and hold you accountable, because I think that's the hardest thing we all find, you know, even for health span coaches. You know, it helps when we have somebody that holds us, you know, holds space for us, holds us accountable, make sure that we're making progress and we're, we're following through with all those all those great changes, because we all have. Uh, a lot of great intention and um, we get very gung-ho and there's a lot of great information out there but it takes a, it's, it's a big um, uh, there's a gap between information and transformation and and, and be able to make big changes um, it, it's really helpful to have somebody just to kind of you know walk you through the process and, and make sure you get where you want to go